grateful for this opportunity to make some effort to serve you on the third day of our pilgrimage in this holy month of Kartik in Sri Jagannath Puri town. Vrindavan Das Thakur, he describes the Ganges River, Ganga Mayi. After long tapasya by Maharaj Bhagirat, she came to this planet Earth. what is now called Gomuk or Gangotri. And how enthusiastically she flows to reach the Bay of Bengal at Ganga Sagara so that she could bathe Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his beloved associates every day here on the shores of Jagannath Puri. When Ganga saw the intimate confidential service that Yamuna Devi offered to Shishiratha Govinda in Vrindavan, in assisting them and all of their devotees in their pastimes, she desired to serve the Lord in that way. And as a fulfillment to her prayers, Shishi Radha Govinda blessed Ganga. That when they come in this age of Kali to perform their pastimes in Navadweep, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. Radha Krishna together become the one form of Lord Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Navadweep is non-different than Vrindavan. And the very same exchanges of love that take place in Vrindavan will take place in Sri Navadweep and Mayapur. And Mother Ganga will be there at the very heart of their pastimes to offer service. After Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left his home to become a sannyasi, the whole of Navadweep the community of devotees was submerged in a bottomless ocean of separation. As we described in our first day, after sannyas, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was eagerly intent to go to Sri Vrindavan town. But by the 
compassion of Lord Nityananda Prabhu. He changed his course to come to Shantipur. And there, through the prayers of his mother, Sachi, and all the devotees, he accepted their wish. The same Krishna that is living in Vrindavan is residing in Puri as Lord Jagannath. And Mother Ganga, with that same intense type of eagerness to be in the presence of the Lord, in the service of the Lord, is forever rushing to the Bay of Bengal to come into the ocean to participate in these pastimes. The prominence of Jagannath Puri, how it has been worshipped by practically all of the great acharyas of all of the sampradayas. Lord Chaitanya, who is the most munificent, the most merciful of all incarnations, who is Krishna himself, Swayam Bhagavan, from whom all other avatars are manifesting. He lived in Jagannath Puri continuously for 18 years. Twenty-four years, which is half of the duration of his pastimes on this earth. His home was Jagannath Puri. Srila Vrindavan Das Thakur in Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, he divides Lord Chaitanya's pastimes in three divisions. The Adi Lila, which is from just prior to Lord Chaitanya's birth to his birth, through the time he goes to Gaya to accept initiation from his spiritual master, Sripad Ishwara Puri Maharaj. When he returns from Gaya, it was then that he established the Harinam Sankirtan movement in Sri Navadweep. This is the beginning of the Madhya Lila. It extends through his most extraordinary pastimes in the house of Srivas among his eternal associates from the spiritual world. From various incarnations, they came to Navadweep to assist Lord Chaitanya in giving this prema of the highest realm of the spiritual world to the most fallen people of Kali Yuga. And their process, primarily, Prema Sankirtan, chanting, dancing. When Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, 
that begins Sri Chaitanya Bhagavati Antya Lila, where he travels to Jagannath Puri. Srila Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami <coughs> in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. He puts the greatest emphasis on the later part of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Adi Lila. went up until Lord Chaitanya took sannyas. Madhya Lila was after taking sannyas, how he came here to Jagannath Puri. And from Puri, he traveled for approximately two years through the provinces of South India, primarily to spread pure bhakti. Then he had the Ratha Yatras and the reunions with all of his devotees for four months every year. And this continued for about six years. During that time, he also made one journey to Vrindavan, went as far as Ramakali and came back and then again, beautiful description of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu traveling through the Jari Khanda forest, spending two months in Vrindavan, and then returning to Puri. During that journey to and from Vrindavan, he instructed Srila Rupa Goswami, Srila Sanatan Goswami. And then when he arrived back here in Puri, this begins the Antyalila, describing the closing 18 years of Lord Chaitanya's pastor. The inconceivable blessing and good fortune that we have, it's not humanly possible to actually comprehend. To be in the presence of the Lord's devotees, under the guidance and divine grace of Srila Prabhupada, our Guru, our Param Guru, to be in the land of the Lord's holy pastimes. And it is here during the Antilila. that Lord Chaitanya as Krishna with the Mahabhav, the love and the complexion of Srimati Radharani internally experienced the deepest happiness of the spiritual world. What are we doing here? If we have any false pride about our importance in this world, um, we're not aware of our good fortune. Who are we? 
Swarup Dhammadar Goswami, Rupa Goswami, Ramananda Rai, Sanatan Goswami, Haridas Thakur, Nityananda Prabhu, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They are longing, yearning. in their devotional service while they're here in Jagannath Puri. So we will begin our talk today. After Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, where did we leave off? I think the Lord was just approaching Bhuvaneshwar. In Bhuvaneshwar, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took his bath at Bindu Sarovar. And it is described that Lord Shiva, upon giving a place, being given this place of residence, a Kamravan by Krishna, he went to every holy river, lake, and ocean in the universe and brought drops of water to fill Bindusrovar, to be his bathing place. After Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu bathed at Bindusrovar, he went to the temple of Lingaraj Bhuvaneshwaram, Ananta Vasudev. In fact, he went to every temple in all of Bhuvaneshwar. And as there are many temples today, there were far more at the time of Lord Chaitanya. And at each one, he was chanting and dancing. All the while, absorbed in his eagerness to be with Lord Jagannath. When when Lord Chaitanya was walking with his associates, Nityananda Prabhu, Jagadananda Pandit, Damodar Pandit, and Mukunda Datta. They stopped at a temple of Shiva, Kapoteshwar Mahadev, just in the area that is called Kamalapur. Lord Chaitanya first bathed in the Arginadi River. Then he entrusted his danda, his staff of sannyasi, to Nityananda Prabhu. Please hold my danda. Then he took his bath. He went into Shiva's temple and he chanted and danced. As they walked forward with great excitement to be in Puri, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu first had his darshan of the flag and the chakra on top of Jagannath's temple. Tears poured from his eyes. 
He offered dandavats, he fell flat in the dust of the ground, offering repeated obeisances. Just prior to this, actually, when Lord Chaitanya, I'm sorry, I'm, when Lord Chaitanya was in the Kapoteshwar Mahadev temple, Nityananda Prabhu, holding the danda of the Lord, he smiled, but he was very serious. And he spoke to the danda. He who I carry in my heart is carrying you. This is not right. And he broke the danda in three pieces and tossed the three pieces in the Arginadi River. Lord Nityananda Prabhu's spirit of service. He's carrying the Lord in his heart. Why, sh why should the Lord be carrying you? I'm, render I'm giving my life to serve the Lord and the Lord is serving you. This is not right. <coughs> Through in a river. Meanwhile, at Kamalapur, when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw the chakra of Jagannath Temple, he taught us how to see Lord Jagannath, how to see Krishna. He repeatedly was chanting a particular verse that standing in front of the temple is a smiling cowherd boy named Balgopal. And he's waiting to cast his glance upon me. He would say this again and again and again. From that distance, to reach the Jagannath temple, Vrindavan Das Thakur tells, it takes a normal person about one and a half hours. But Lord Chaitanya, he kept in his anticipation and his eagerness to serve Jagannath, to be seen by Jagannath, to serve Jagannath. He kept offering his dandavats. He kept fainting. It took him nine hours until he reached the Ataranala, a bridge with 18 arches. There he became peaceful in an external state of consciousness. And he turned to Nityananda Prabhu, said, please give me my danda. Lord Nityananda Prabhu, he said, um, actually, at the Bhaginadi River, you fell down and I caught you and we both fell on the danda and it broke in three places and I think it went into the river, it's gone. He said, 
please forgive me for my offense. You can punish me in any way you like. Now, Srila Prabhupada describes from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada and our Acharya's commentaries, the depths and the profound lessons that came from the breaking of the dandas. In fact, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami and Vrindavan Das Thakur tell that um, Unless you're a pure devotee on the highest level, you cannot understand the meaning of this pastime. Srila Prabhupada writes, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. He cites this beautiful verse. Krishna, seeking to taste the happiness of Sri Radharani's love, trying to understand what it is about himself that only she relishes through her love, and understanding the nature of Sri Radha's love, the one thing that Krishna does not know Bhagavad Gita tells, Vedaham samatitani vartamanani chajuna. Krishna knows everything. Past, present, future, he knows all beings. But yet the depths of the love of Sri Radha, he's longing to understand and experience. So Krishna comes with the Mahabhav of Sri Radha, and that is Lord Chaitanya. They are eternally one. They are eternally in two forms, Radha Krishna, and they are eternally coming into one form, as Lord Chaitanya. So Krishna is the absolute goal of life. He's the cause of all causes. People take sannyas to renounce the world, to dedicate themselves exclusively for the service of the Lord. In the impersonalistic school, people are striving with this conception of becoming one with God. In the Vaishnav school, sannyas is to dedicate one's body, one's mind, one's words, and one's life to serve the Lord. Lord Chaitanya taught that the Purusharta Siromani, the supreme crest jewel of all goals, is to love Krishna. At the final stage of sannyas paramhamsa, one generally does not carry a danda. It's not a regulative principle. Paramhamsa is that totally liberated state beyond any materialistic attachments or egos in pure devotional service to the Lord. Lord Nityananda Prabhu, knowing Lord Chaitanya is infinitely beyond Paramhamsa, he is Krishna. Why does he have to bother with this regulative principle of carrying a dunda around? So he broke it in pieces. Actually, 
He didn't do it in a thoughtful way. He did it in a, a mood of transcendental ecstasy of love and appreciation for Lord Chaitanya. And Rajendra Nandana Jai Sachi Shuta Hoi Lo She Balarama Hoi Lo Nitai. Krishna came as Lord Chaitanya and Balaram came as Nityananda Prabhu. Balaram is the first expansion of Krishna. He's not different than Krishna. He's the original servitor of Krishna. So Nityananda Prabhu, to establish the supreme position of Lord Chaitanya. He broke Danda and put it in the river. Lord Chaitanya internally was very happy, but externally he wanted, he was playing the role of a devotee He had just taken sannyas within a couple of weeks before. He turned to Lord Nityananda and he said, that danda is the only possession left in my life. And you just lost it. Lord Chaitanya said, do you not know that all the demigods are present within the danda of a sannyasi? And then the Lord said, you are all my friends. You have brought me here. There at Ataranala, sing the dome and the chakra of Jagannath's temple. After so long journey, they're now so close. Lord Jaitanya said, you could all go ahead of me or go after me but I will go into Puri alone. Mukunda Dutt, he said, it is only appropriate that you go first. After some time, we will follow behind. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, very swiftly, Tears flooding his eyes with his arms stretched out. He was running toward the Jagannath temple. And when he came into the doors of the temple and from a great distance away, he first saw the form of Lord Jagannath. Lord Chaitanya, swiftly ran to embrace the Lord. But as he was coming closer, seeing the form of Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra before him, the ecstasy of love caused him to fall to the ground with practically no state of consciousness. It was just at that time that the great scholar Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya came into the temple for the darshan. And he happened to see this, this beautiful form of a young 24-year-old sannyasi with such symptoms 
of ecstatic spiritual love falling to the ground. He was astounded. Seeing Lord Chaitanya laying on the floor, some of the guards of the temple, they picked up their sticks and they were about to beat the Lord. At that moment, Vrindavan Das Thakur describes Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya threw his body over the body of Lord Chaitanya so that the guards would not hurt him. As soon as they saw Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, he was such a scholar, he was a teacher for the king of Orissa, Prataparudra. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was such a cultured, elderly, saintly person. Swamis, Babas, Pandits, they would come to learn from him. Immediately, the guards, they, they withdrew. Sarvabhama Bhattacharya was trying to bring Lord Chaitanya back to consciousness. But he couldn't. He was wondering, is he still alive? There were no external symptoms of life in his form. But he put a little piece of cotton and saw slight movement from his breath. And Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, being a great scholar of scriptures, understood that this is the, the most profoundly deep ecstasy of spiritual samadhi a person could be in. So he called the guards and the Dietapatis, the same servants of Jagannath that carry Lord Jagannath to the chariot at Ratiyatra time. He had them pick up Lord Chaitanya and carry him to his own house. While the Lord was at Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya's house, Nityananda Prabhu, Makunda Datta, Jagadananda, and Damodar Pandits arrived. They came to the Singadwaram, the front gate of Jagannath's temple, where Lord Chaitanya had entered. Before entering the temple, they asked, Have there any of you seen? a sannyasi that has just come here. And already people were talking about what had happened. He has been brought to the house of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Actually at that moment, Gopinathacharya had just come to the Singhadwaram to enter into the temple. Gopinath Acharya was the brother-in-law of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. And he was a resident of Navadweep. So he knew very well the devotees from that time. And he heard from the local people also. So he brought them all to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya's home. During Yatra, how many of you have gone to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya's house? Please raise both of your hands. Say Haribo.
I think if you're <clears throat> following the schedule of the Yatra, everyone will be going there. And we will discuss some of the pastimes that took place there on another day. But when all the devotees came, um, they were welcomed by Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Gopinathacharya and Lord's four associates. They saw Lord Chaitanya laying lifeless on the floor. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya offered his pranams to everyone. They all requested his blessings. At that time, they chanted the holy names trying to revive the Lord. But Lord Chaitanya remained motionless. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya told the devotees, all of you now, you go for the darshan of Jagannath. I will take care of Sri Krishna Chaitanya. So they went for the darshan of Jagannath and they came back to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya's house. Lord Chaitanya, remained in that state for the next nine hours. As they were chanting in his ears the holy names of the Lord. when he manifested his external consciousness. There was a deep bond of affection between him and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. At the time, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was still very much an impersonal philosopher. Still, he showed so much affection for the Lord, like a father to a son. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu responded to that. He said to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, you are like my father, you have protected me. You have brought me safely to your home. Now I am under your shelter. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Actually, Lord Chaitanya said it. After he heard everything that had happened, he said, now I am in your shelter. And I will not go to the temple alone. I will go with you or your assistance. And I will not come close to Lord Jagannath, but rather I will stand beside the Garuda Stamba. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya then brought Lord Chaitanya before Lord Jagannath. We have with us this evening His Holiness Bhakti Purushottam Swami Maharaj. He is born and raised a resident of Jagannath Puri. And how deep is the culture of Jagannath Puri, 
in his very heart and soul. Every year, he brings thousands of people to Puri for yatras. He's written a series of books in glorification of Lord Jagannath and Purushottam Shetra Puri. And I'm remembering my very esteemed God brother, Shiksha Guru, His Holiness, Srila Gaur Govinda Swami Maharaj. <coughs> From Odisha, he was born and raised a loving devotee of Lord Jagannath. And how his heart and soul was to present the glories of Lord Jagannath to the whole world. And I'm remembering <coughs> some years ago, it was the appearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada. And many of the leaders of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness were gathered together for GBC and leadership meetings and wonderful Sangam. And on that morning, I met Srila Gaur Govinda Swami Maharaj. And I bowed my head and took dust from his feet. And he touched the ground and then he embraced me. And it was with so much kindness. And as he was embracing me, he said, Thank you very much for your service to Srila Prabhupada. And I had tears in my eyes. I, I said, Maharaj, thank you very much for your service to Srila Prabhupada and your great kindness upon me. That evening, I was with His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. <clears throat> <clears throat> and we were having a long talk, walking around Srila Prabhupada's Pushpa Samadhi in Mayapur. And somebody came running up to, running up to me and said, Srila Gorgo Vinda Maharaj is very ill. Please come. So I just ran and I went to his room. And when I arrived at his room, He had just departed from this material world to return to Goloka Vrindavan. And just minutes before, the devotees, they were telling me that just before he left, he was telling the story 
of the origin of Lord Jagannath. How he manifested this form of the Mahabhava Prakash. And it was while telling this story at the very conclusion, which is the topmost imaginable story of Lord Chaitanya and Jagannath's Leela, that he departed from the world. So our beloved God brother Bhakta Rupa Prabhu and Madhavananda Prabhu and disciples of Srila Gaur Govinda Maharaj has, have published many of the lectures and form, put them in publicate, publication books, giving the world this great treasure that was his very life and soul. So I'd like to, in my own very insignificant, unqualified way, I'd like to share some of the stories that he shared with all of us. How it is that of all the deities of Krishna in the world, Krishna appeared in this form along with his brother and sister. Can I make a confession? I might as well. I became a devotee in Brindaban. And at the time, there was no ISKCON existence in Brindaban. This was 1971-72. So none of Srila Prabhupada's devotees were there yet. There was no land. And I, I was on my way to worship Shiva in Amarnath, but somehow or other, I, I ended up in Mathura on Janmashtami day. And then I went to Brindavan and when I tried to leave, I got typhoid fever. So by the time I got better, I had decided I will never leave Brindavan for the rest of my life. And I actually pray, I never, um, I never get cured of that fever. <laughs> but anyways, my visa ended and I had to go. And on my way to the West, I stopped in London. There was a temple in Berry Place. And it was the second Iskan temple I was ever at. The first was in Amsterdam and then London. And when I went to the temple room, it was the first time since I left Brindaban. I can't tell you what a reunion it was to see Radha Londonishwar, the beautiful deities of Radha and Krishna, the first deities Srila Prabhupada installed in ISKCON. When I was living in Vrindavan, everywhere was Radha and Krishna deities and temples. And such an oasis in a desert of so much illusory energy of the, of the Western world, there was Radha and Krishna. And there was a shelf on the altar on top of Radha and Krishna. 
Um, man, da can you do? We, we, you, you were there at the time, I think. And there were these forms, Jagannath Balaram Subhadra. And I was thinking, what is that? And I was already, because I was living with so many sadhus and Vrijabhasis, I wasn't really, I, I gave my heart to Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan, but I didn't know anything about ISKCON or anything like that. So I asked somebody, well, I see Radha and Krishna, but, but what is that above them? And he said, that is Jagannath, that's Krishna. And I was thinking, <laughs> these Western hippies, <laughs> they're trying to, they're trying to make Krishna psychedelic. <laughs> I didn't say anything, but I was thinking like that. Some kind of preaching um, strategy. And I was afraid to say anything because I was like a foreigner. And I, but later I learned about who Jagannath Balaram and Subhadra is. But this form is very transcendental. And Srila Govinda Swami Maharaj, he brought us by the hand, all of us, into the inner realm of how Lord Jagannath is <coughs> supremely intimate form of Krishna in his utmost state of revelation of his love for Srimati Radharani. And Srila Prabhupada, knowing that Lord Jagannath is, is Krishna in the form that Sri Radha met in Well, I'll tell the story. But Jagannath Balaram Subhadra are so merciful. There are now millions of sets of Jagannath deities and homes and temples all over the world by Srila Prabhupada's compassion. Srila Govinda Swami Maharaj wanted all of us to understand the inner depths of Srila Prabhupada's compassion and what he's actually giving us. So he tells story. in Dwarka. Krishna has 16,108 queens. Each one of them is, the, is a manifestation, a personification, an expansion of the goddess of fortune from the spiritual world.
The queens of Dwarka are on a higher, in a higher in a sense of intimate, confidential, loving service than Lakshmi and Vaikuntha. Their devotion, their love, their beauty, their opulences are beyond human imagination. They are the Lakshmis of the spiritual world. And they're speaking among each other. We are giving our life, our souls, with all care, exclusively to make Krishna happy. And Krishna expanded himself to live with each and every one of them personally. And yet, at night, when Krishna is resting, he's calling out, Gopi, Gopi, Radhe, Radhe. And one of the queens, she said, why you're saying at night, even in the day he does like this. He goes into a state like a trance and calls out, Radhe, Radhe, Gopi, Gopi. Who is this Radha? Who is these Gopis? What is it about them? And what are the pastimes of love that they share with Krishna? That it seems that Krishna is always thinking of them. One of the queens of Dwarka asked Krishna, and Krishna said, actually, my love is for Radharani and Gopis. I only married you because you remind me of them in separation from them. Who are these residents of Brindaban? They all approached Rohini. Rohini Devi has a very, very special place in Krishna's pastimes. She's Balaram's mother. She's a wife of Vasudev. When she was living in Mathura, Devaki and Vasudev were in prison. Rohini had relation, she could visit Vasudev. She was pregnant and Vasudev sent her across the Yamuna River to Gokula to be in the shelter of Nanda and Yashoda. So before Krishna's birth, before Balaram's birth, Rohini and Yashoda, when they met, it was like Ganga and Yamuna coming together at Prayag. Their affection, their respect, their pastimes with each other, they just merged into such a oneness of, of loving companionship. After some time, Balaramji was born of Rohini. And little Balaram, he was just an infant baby. Rohini put him on the lap of Yashoda, who was pregnant with Krishna. And Balaram, 
she embraced Balaram and Balaram felt so close to Krishna. His happiness was so infinitely manifesting that the entire Vrindavan became illuminated with joy without even knowing why, just by the happiness of Balaram. He's just this close being pressed against Yashoda Mai's body to Krishna. And just 15 days after Balaram, not 15, eight days was it? Yes, eight days after Balaram's birth, Krishna took birth. So Rohini Devi and Yashoda Mai, they were always together with baby Gopal and Baladev. Rohini was intimately in the very heart of all of Krishna and Balaram's pastimes in Vrindavan. After Akrura came to take Krishna to Mathura, Nanda and some of the cowherd men, or cowherd boys too, they went with Akrura and Krishna Balaram to Mathura. But Krishna sent them all back to Vrindavan, where they remained in separation for the rest of the years. It was only Rohini Beside Krishna Balaram, she was the only person living in Dwarka who was a direct personal participant of Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. So all the queens of Dwarka, they came to Rohini, please tell us, tell us about this loving exchanges between Krishna and Sri Radharani and Gopis. Rohini Mai, she said, I can try to explain them, but you cannot understand because your nature is Aishwarya Bhava. You love Krishna intimately. With reverence toward his majesty, toward his opulence, toward his supreme power. The residents of Vrindavan they exclusively possess Madhurya Bhava, where they have no concern, they have no comprehension of the opulence and majesty of Krishna. It is covered by his sweetness. They love him as an equal friend, as a child dependent upon their love, or as a lover. Where Krishna openly confesses that he is conquered by the sweetness of the love of the gopis. Yashodamai binds Krishna with ropes. We do not find this in Dwarka or in Vaikuntha. Where 
when Krishna dances with gopis. This type of dance, we do not find any avatar of the Lord. We don't see Ram dancing. <laughs> we don't see Varaha Dev or Kurma or Matsya or Parasaram. <laughs> it's only Krishna. He plays flute, he dances, he simply loves. She said, the pastimes of Vrindavan are so sweet. They are so intimate. And they are so supremely dear to Krishna Balaram. That if I try to share with you the leelas of Rajbhumi, Krishna Balaram will immediately understand that I'm speaking about Vrindavan, and they will come. And if they, are, if they are here, the transformations that will take place in their hearts, I will be unable to speak. So someone should guard the door. Can you imagine this assembly? We see the assembly today. I was told there's over 10,000 devotees here now, this evening. Just the queens of Dwarkov, they're coming together. That's 16,000. <laughs> Rohini didn't need a sound system. <laughs> it took devotees like over a week to set up this, the sound system, the pangal, everything. But Dwaraka, Rohini began to speak. But before, she had to be assured that someone would call out and warn her that Krishna and Balaram are coming. Su Subhadra, Krishna's younger sister, daughter of Vasudeva and Devaki. Subhadra agreed, I will stand at the door. She went right in the middle of the doorway and stretched out both of her arms so that no one could come in or out. And she said, if Krishna and Balaram come, I will call out that they're coming. And then Rohini said, then I will stop speaking. Because if they, if they hear what I'm saying, everything will be finished. So Subhadra is standing at the doorway, their arms stretched. Rohini began to describe the pastimes of Vrindavan. The queens of Dwarka were utterly struck with wonder. In the spiritual realm, and we especially learn these stories from our acharyas in writings like the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, which is describing the spirit of the great, the great souls of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Ramayana, Mahabharata. A simple quality that defines a true devotee is they have no envy.
this is very difficult to comprehend. In one recording, on the first verse of Bhagavad Gita, where Dhritarashtra is asking, Dhritarashtra Uvacha Dharamakshetre Kudukshetre. What is happening in this holy place of Kudukshetra? where the Pandavas and the Kurus are assembled before the war. And Srila Prabhupada describes the foundational principle of material existence is envy. This propensity is so deeply seated in a conditioned soul. When we're trying to be controller, proprietor, or enjoyer, that's an expression of envy toward God. Because God is the supreme proprietor, controller, and enjoyer. Oktaram Jagyatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suradam Sarva Bhutanam Yatvamam Shanti Richjati. When we recognize this and live in this spirit, we could actually find real peace, real happiness. And when that propensity of envy is there toward God, because all living beings are part and parcel of Krishna, then we are potentially envious of anyone. Prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani This ahankar, this false ego, that I am the knower, I am the doer, I am the proprietor. It's at the basis of material suffering. What is a Vaishnav? When we recognize Krishna's greatness and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Sanatana Goswami he established the basic principle of a devotee is Chivera Swarupoy Krishna Ranityatas. We are eternally the servants of Krishna. Srinvatam Sukata Krishna Punya Sravana Kirtana. When we find joy in hearing Krishna's greatness, Krishna's beauty, Krishna's wealth, his strength, his knowledge, his love. That's where our happiness is. When we actually are genuinely developing a taste for Krishna's glories. We're satisfied with Krishna's greatness. Therefore, there's no envy toward anyone. Envy is when somebody is trespassing our own illusory yearning to be the enjoyer, the proprietor, the controller, Pratishta, we want fame, but when we enjoy Krishna's fame, we actually find great happiness in honor and respecting how Krishna is manifesting in other people.
in Brihat Bhagavatam Rita. That one devotee is, is going to various great personalities, saying, you are the greatest. And they say, no, no, I am insignificant. Can you imagine? They go to Pramad Mahara. They go to Brahma. And Brahma, you are the greatest. And Brahma says, I'm nothing compared to Shiva. And he's glorifying Shiva. He goes to Shiva, you are the greatest. Actually, I'm insignificant compared to Prahlad. Goes to Prahlad, you are so great. After hearing the glories of Prahlad by Lord Shiva, but what am I doing? Look what Hanuman is doing. In this way, greatness is defined among Vaishnavas as those who appreciate other devotees' greatness. In other words, no envy, not a competition. When Prahlad is glorifying Hanuman, he's not thinking, I want to be Hanuman. He's eternally greater than me, but he's giving pleasure to the Lord. That is my happiness. And I'm doing what I can. That is the spiritual world. In Goloka Vrindavan, it's Chintamani Dham. Everybody, whatever is their wish in the loving service toward Krishna is fulfilled. So there's a plant. A plant is there giving leaves. Tulsi's giving leaves. Tulsi's not dancing with Krishna, but she's on Krishna's feet. The gopis are praising Tulsi, and Tulsi is praising gopis. But even the dust and the ground is fully conscious Paramahamsa, pure devotees of the Lord. They're not envious of gopis. Their joy is in the love of the gopis and Krishna's love of the gopis. Let me assist by being soft under their feet. Let them dance on me. That is Vrindavan. No one is envious of Sri Radha. Every living entity and Goloka Vrindavan is far greater than anything in material existence as far as quantity. Everyone is simply finding joy and assisting in their own ways the wonderful pastimes of Radha and Krishna. And everyone is enjoying the greatness of other service and let me assist. That is the spiritual world. So Rohini is describing the wonderful glories of Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. Nanda and Yashoda, the cowherd boys playing with Krishna, dancing with Krishna joking with Krishna, and ultimately the gopis, the intensity of their total renunciation of everything forever for Krishna's service. Srila Prabhupada tells story. just to show the nature of Vrindavan's love. In Dwarka, Krishna told Narada Muni, I have headache. I need the dust of the feet of my devotees. He went to many devotees. Krishna has a headache. Give, he needs the dust of your feet to apply to his head. Could you imagine? 
Devotees are very intelligent. Krishna is the supreme master. I'm an eternal servant. I can't put my foot dust on his head. I'll go to hell if I do that. So for all the right reasons, nobody would give. But there's right, more right than most right. When he asked gopis, they immediately started collecting every particle of dust they could scrape from their feet and put them in containers. Narada Muni said, do you really want to do this? Do you know what will happen to you? They said, yes, of course, we'll go to hell. But if Krishna has a headache, we are willing to go to hell for the rest of eternity if it, if it gives him one moment of relief. And they're not just saying it. They're putting their lives eternally on the line for Krishna's pleasure. So this is just an indication of the spirit when Krishna played upon his flute at Bamsivat and Bank of Yamuna, when all the gopis left everything behind, they were willing to risk everything forever to give Krishna happiness. How sweet is the love that Krishna shares with those devotees. So the queens, they're hearing, they're relishing. There's no envy. They may feel themselves totally insignificant in their ability to give Krishna pleasure as the gopis. But it's not with envy. It's actually they're feeling great happiness in hearing how gopis are giving pleasure to Krishna. So as they're all totally absorbed in the sweetest state of samadhi, hearing Rohini give this Braj Lila Kata, Krishna Balaram, immediately they knew Rohini is speaking about Vrindavan. It's Krishna's in everyone's heart. Tatra tishtami narada yatra gayanti madbhakta. Krishna tells, wherever my devotees are chanting my names and glories, I am there. And it doesn't take him time to get here. He's immediately there. So as soon as Rohini be began to speak, everyone is in rapt attention and Krishna Balaram come running to the place. Meanwhile, Subhadra Mai, Lady Subhadra, she's standing guarding the door She's assigned, Krishna and Balaram are coming as soon as the indication. But by hearing about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, Subhadra's two arms that are blocking the door, in her ecstasy, they enter into her body. Her legs enter into her body. Her neck enters into her body. Her eyes become dilated. Gorkovinda Maharaj tells Mahabhava Prakash. She's in a state of complete ecstasy, of internal trance. Krishna Krishna stands on her left side and Balaram stands on her right side 
and they're listening to Rohini narrate the pastimes of Vrindavan. Their eyes dilate. Feeling the love of Srimati Radharani, the gopis and the residents of Vrindavan, hearing about their pastimes, feeling their love, they go into such a state of ecstasy. Because Krishna Balaram Subhadra, they are their bodies. We are not our bodies. We're eternal souls. Srila Prabhupada describes when Krishna was on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, he was over a hundred years old and he still looked like a young boy. Krishna's a controller of time. Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vikra. His form is eternal, full of knowledge and full of ecstasy. So what is inside and what is outside, there is no difference. So the ecstatic feelings of love in separation from Brindaban, Krishna's feelings of separation from Srimati Radharani in the core of his heart was manifested on his body. And that is the form of Jagannath. So similar to what we have on our altar, Jagannath, Subhadra, and Balaramji, they're standing at the doorway together like tortoises with their limbs within their bodies and their eyes in ecstatic amazement dilated. where they're actually physically manifesting the highest ecstasies of Krishna's love and separation from Sri Radha. That's what the form of Jagannath is. What you are feeling, I cannot see. I could see indications sometimes of what you're feeling. And sometimes we're very expert at hiding any indications of what we're feeling. Lord Jagannath is the, the ecstasy of the highest happiness of Krishna in his feelings of separation in love for Sri Radha from the core of his hearts are manifested in the form of Jagannath. As they're standing in this way, Rohini can't continue speaking and Narada Muni comes and he sees the darshan. And as he comes closer, Krishna Balaram and Subhadra, they come out of their ecstatic Mahabhava Prakash trance and they manifest their regular forms. Narada Muni calls out, I have seen, I have seen. I have seen the Mahabhava Prakash. The deities of Jagannath, Baladeva, and Subhadra are revealing the supreme glories of Vrindavan from Krishna, Balaram, and Subhadra's hearts. 
and Narada Muni prays for a benediction. I have seen this Mahabhav Prakash, the supreme love of Sri Radha, how you are controlled in separation from that. Let the darshan of this form forever be in this world for people to come to see so that you can shower your mercy upon the conditioned souls of this world in this unique, extraordinary form. And Krishna said, Krishna told Narada Muni and blessed the whole world that well, I will forever live in this form in Jagannath Puri. Even in India, it's so rare that anybody understands the depth and the glories of who Lord Jagannath is. And yet, Srila Prabhupada had devotees making Jagannath deities all over the world. Because even it, even though it is so supremely high in the rasa. Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra are so supremely accommodating, accessible, and mercy to the fallen souls. And then Srila Gorgovinda Maharaj tells another story. that in Dwarka, just as in Brindaban, Sri Radha and Gopis are crying in separation from Krishna. Srila Krishna Kaviraj Goswami writes that when Akrura took Krishna and Balaram from Vrindavan, he said the gopis cried for the rest of their lives. Now in this world, crying is not considered something you want to do. But on the spiritual level, love has manifests as Sambhog and Vipralamba. There is the lover and the object of love. And the exchange between the Ashrai and the Vishai is Prema or love, and that is Brindavan. And the love of union and the love of separation are inseparable from one another. One nourishes the other. Separation intensifies the joy of union and union intensifies the experience of love and separation. The Brajlila is the highest. Krishna lived in Vrindavan for just under 11 years. And 
and for the next almost 100 and he was in this planet 125 years. 11 years, he was sambog with the residents of Vrindavan. And the rest of the time, their love was in separation. In fact, in Brihad Bhagavatamrita, Krishna was asked, why don't you go back to Vrindavan? And he described in many ways, but in one place, that the love of the residents of Vrindavan in separation for me is so deep. It is so all-encompassing. It is so supreme that it just keeps getting more and more, and it can't get any more, but it keeps getting more. Their love and separation is an ecstasy that if I go there, it can't increase it. This was Lord Chaitanya's message to the world to cultivate love in separation. When we are with someone we love, the love of our heart goes out for the pleasure of that person. In separation on a spiritual level, because Krishna is actually within the core of our hearts reciprocating, in separation our love goes deeper and deeper and deeper within. And Krishna within the heart through his bhava expansion is embracing the residence of Vrindavan. So the feelings of Radharani gopis, Nanda Yashoda gopas, the feelings that they're feeling toward Krishna while they're in separation of Vrindavan. Krishna's feelings in Dwarka are corresponding. He's feeling, he's yeyatamam prapadyante tams tadaiva bhajamya. As we surrender, as we love Krishna, Krishna reciprocates accordingly. So in Vrindavan, as gopis are crying, Krishna, Krishna, in Dwarka, Krishna's crying, gopi, gopi. He's chanting their names, and especially Srimati Radharani. So one day, as Krishna is chanting the names of Sri Radha and remembering her, as Radha has fainted in Vrindavan, Krishna faints in Dwarka. And nobody can bring him back to consciousness. Srila Govinda Maharaj describes Narada Muni comes. And Uddhava, Krishna's dear, most, most confidential friend. And Balaram appears. The three of them are discussing. Krishna is in an unconscious, lifeless state in separation from the residents of Vrindavan. The only thing that will bring him out of this state and bring him back to consciousness, Narada Muni, please sing the glories of Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. Narada Muni said, I, I will do that. But if I begin to chant Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes, 
when Krishna comes back to external consciousness, he will immediately run to Brindaban. So we should arrange his chariot and get his driver, Daruka, to be prepared to immediately bring Krishna to Brindaban. Uddhava, he said, this is, this is not such a good idea because I've been to Brindavan. The devotees there, they're fainting. They're in so much separation. They're hardly alive. If Krishna goes to Brindavan and sees them in that state, it will be intolerable for him. And he'll never be able to leave the residence of Vrindavan when he sees what he's done to them. He'll never come back to Dwaraka. So Narada Muni, he said, Uddhava, you are Krishna's most trusted messenger. Go to Vrindavan. Tell all the Brijabhasis that Krishna's coming. He's on a chariot. He's on his way. And they will be so happy. They will have a great festival of joy to welcome him. Uddhava said, Krishna sent me as a messenger to Vrindavan to console the residents. And I was there for three months trying to console them. But nothing will relieve them unless Krishna returns. I failed in my mission. I promised them that when I go back to Mathura, I will tell Krishna to come immediately to Vrindavan. So all of you just be patient and I will try to bring Krishna back as soon as possible. When I returned to Mathura, time and again, I pleaded with Krishna, go to Vrindavan. And he says, I will go. I will go, but he never goes. So if I go back there now and I say Krishna's coming, who will believe me? They will think, they will think I have lied before and I'm lying again. So I'm not a good messenger. Uddhava, and Narada Muni turned to Balaram, said, Balaram, you should go. Balaram began to cry. He felt so much of the condition of the love and separation of the residents of Vrindavan. He said, I also went. I'm, I'm willing to go at any time but no one will believe me. I was there for two months trying to console the residents of Vrindavan. But how, you, how can you cons console a fish that's out of water? They're dying in separation from Krishna. The only thing that keeps them alive is Krishna's promise to return. Otherwise, there's nothing for them to live for. Seeing the condition of gopis, gopas, my old friends, I could not console them. The only thing that will work is if Krishna returns. Now, Balaram, 
Yashodamaya Nanda Maharaj. They loved him and he loved them as his own parents, multiplied by limitless trillions of times of what relation could be between a parent and a child in this world. Seeing Mother Yashoda's constant crying, begging Balaram to bring Krishna back. Balaram said, I promised her, I will go to Dwarka and I will tell Krishna, you must come to Brindaban. And I tried to pacify her and she believed me. And I came back to Dwarka, Krishna, the residents of Brindaban are dying. Give up whatever else you're doing. It doesn't matter. Let us go to Brindaban. And Krishna's answer is always, yes, I will go. I will go. Balaram expressed, whatever I ask Krishna to do, he always does. But this one thing he will never do. If I go back to Vrindavan, how can I face Mother Yashoda and tell her that Krishna's coming? She will not believe me. At that moment, Subhadra came upon them. And very happily, she said, it is not a problem. I will go. Everyone will believe me. They have no reason not to believe me. When I go to the gopis, I will tell them, I'm a simple lady like you. Krishna's coming. In fact, Krishna Balaram, we all got on our chariots together. We all left together. But so many great personalities, kings and maharajas, they were all welcoming Krishna and Balaram and having receptions on their way here that they are delayed, but I have come early to tell you that they're just now coming. Krishna and Balaram are on their chariots. Let us arrange a wonderful, joyous festival to welcome them. Uddhava, Narada, Balaram, they said yes. Balaram said, Subhadra, I will go with you. How can I let my sister go alone? So two more chariots were arranged. Subhadra and Balaram left. Narada Muni began to sing the glories of Vrindavan. Instantly, Krishna jumped up and stood in his tribhanga, his threefold bending form, with his hands holding a flute, but there was no flute. He asked, where is my flute? Where is my flute? Did the gopis take my flute again? He was completely oblivious to Dwarka. In Mathura and Dwarka, we never see forms of Krishna bent in three places, playing flute or with peacock feather. That mood of loving reciprocation is exclusive for Brindaban. Krishna went running, looking for his flute. And he saw Narada Muni. He said, Narada, what are you doing here in Brindaban? Then he saw Uddhava. He said, Uddhava, why are you in Brindaban? And then he looked around and he realized he wasn't in Brindaban. 
And immediately Narada Muni and Uddhava, they said, we have your chariot ready. We'll take you immediately to Vrindavan. And Krishna, feeling the eagerness, the anticipation to go to Vrindavan, he could hardly walk. It was as if he was intoxicating in that prema. And he was shaking and going back and forth and trembling. When Jagannath is going on his chariot for the Ratiyatra, he is in this mood returning to Brindavan, represented by Gundicha. And he's also swaying back and forth and shaking. And I remember several times we have come for the Ratiyatra, and I was watching this Pahandi, or in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is called the Pandu Vijaya, bringing Jagannath Balaram and Subhadra from their from the from their thrones in the Jagannath temple to their chariots for the procession to Vrindavan. How many of have witnessed the Pahandi at Ratiyatra. Please say Haribo. You have seen Jagannath is wearing this extraordinary um, crown and he's going back and forth and Balaram is the same way. And uh, one of our very merciful friends is one of the Dayatapatis. And he was carrying along with so many others, Lord Jagannath. And after the whole Ratiyatra, I asked him, you know, how, how do all of you together carrying J Jagannath? Because Jagannath is pretty large size. How do you coordinate it to make him be going back and forth and shaking and all of this? He said, no, that's Jagannath doing that. We're all just trying to hold him still. Like a person who's very intoxicated, cannot walk so well. Jagannath is, he can't walk to his chariot, Krishna. So Uddhava and Narada Muni are holding him and he's going like the Pahandi, bringing him to his chariot. And when he boards chariots, Daruka, take him right to Vrindavan. And very swiftly, like the wind, Daruka begins driving. Meanwhile, um, Subhadra and Balaram arrive in Vrindavan. When Balaram sees the condition of this Vipralamba Bhava, this love and separation of the residents of Vrindavan, He is so intensely affected. The condition of his heart manifests in the form of his body. And like a tortoise, his arms, his leg, his neck, all his limbs enter into his body and sing the love of the residents of Vrindavan. His eyes dilate. And the same exact experience is manifested in the body of Subhadra. 
So they're totally immovable. Like forms of wood. Subhadra can't go and tell Yashoda that Krishna is coming. She can't say anything to anyone. They're speechless. And Krishna, Krishna's chariot, while all this is happening, and Krishna's just deporting Brindavan, Yoga Maya is orchestrating everything so perfectly. Srimati Radharani comes to her kunja of Niduban. And her separation in love for Krishna reaches such limits and beyond that she cries Krishna's name and falls to the ground, practically lifeless. Her dear, her dear friends, the Sakis, are trying to revive her, but they cannot. So the word spreads throughout all of Vrindavan that Srimati Radharani is about to leave her body. They're taking dust from her feet, begging, praying, please, if Radharani leaves her body, everyone in Vrindavan will die. And there's absolutely no hope that Krishna will ever return. So it is at this state that Krishna's chariot arrives in Niduban. And he sees Srimati Radharani in her supreme state of love and separation. He jumps off of his chariot crying, crying out Srimati Radharani's holy names. And seeing her in that state and feeling her love, he becomes like a tortoise. Mahabhava Prakash. His eyes dilate, gazing upon Sri Radha. His arms and legs enter into his body. He becomes motionless as wood, tears pouring from his eyes, and he falls to the ground without consciousness. By Yoga Maya's arrangement, a breeze touched Krishna's body and then came and touched Srimati Radharani's body and it revived her. Lalita Saki is calling in her name, whispering, Krishna's, Krishna's calm, Krishna's calm. And Radharani comes awake and she sees Krishna in his form of Jagannath. She indicates to her friend Vishaka to revive Krishna. And she whispers in Krishna's ear, in Jagannath's ear, that Radharani is here. And Krishna comes to consciousness. And they are both, after so many long years, they are together. The Vipralamba has reached a crescendo to bring them together in some book, in loving reunion. They spent the night in Niduban together. They rested. And in 
in the morning, the sakis were singing, the cuckoos were singing. And Krishna, he told Srimati Radharani that like a log, I was floating in the ocean of your love. And that form that I manifested I will reside forever in Jagannath Puri. And because my brother Balaram and Subhadra helped bring me here, they will also accompany as Jagannath Baladev Subhadra to manifest our love and separation from you. And in the age of Kali, you will appear. I will, I will appear again as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, experiencing your love and separation from me. And for all those fortunate jivas or conditioned souls and most fortunate devotees. Those who come to Puri to have the darshan and render service to Jagannath Balaram and Subhadra, I will give them the opportunity for pure devotional service, liberated from all suffering forever in the spiritual world of Vrindavan. This opportunity that we all have is the blessing of coming to Puri. Why Gaur Govinda Swami Maharaj shared these stories with us? In his own spirit of compassion and service, it was to give us an indication of what Srila Prabhupada has given to each one of us and to the world. When Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was coming to Puri in his ecstasies of eagerness of love and separation from Srimati, from, from Krishna in the mood of Sri Radha, how he is fainting, the ecstatic symptoms he's having. Lord Jagannath is forever manifesting his form in loving separation from Sri Radha. Lord Chaitanya is in the mood of Sri Radha in separation from Krishna. So what is these 18 years of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes in Jagannath Puri? It is the reciprocation between Sri Radha's love and Krishna's love manifesting in this world. Srila Prabhupada was in the midst of his great mission of translating the entire 18,000 verses of Srimad Bhagavatam with elaborate purports according to the commentaries of our great acharyas. But in the midst of that, he decided to also translate and give us the purports to Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. So 
such a gift. Originally, I believe it was 17 volumes, Sri Chaitanya Charita. And although it is so high, the Srimad Bhagavatam, it culminates in the love of separation of Sri Radha for Krishna and Krishna for Sri Radha. And Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, especially the Jagannath Puri pastimes, is beginning from that point. We are so unqualified. And the more we realize we're unqualified to even hear these things, what to speak of shamelessly trying to speak these things, the more we realize we're unqualified, the door opens to our qualification. When we know high topics, and it influences us to think I know better than others, and to think I'm greater than others, it means we, we really don't understand what it is. Krishna Das Kapiraj Goswami He's describing these pastimes of the Gambira. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna tasting the deepest ecstasies of Srimati Radharani in the confidential association of Lalita Saki and Ramananda Rai, I mean Lalita Saki and Vishaka in the form of Swarup Damodar Goswami and Ramananda Rai. In the Gambira, except the two of them, nobody knew what was being discussed. There was no live streaming in the Gambira. There were no tape recorders. <laughs> this was most confidential. But by the mercy of Lord Nityananda Prabhu and the Sikh and Rupa and Sanatana and Raghunath Das Goswami, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami was given the information of the pastimes, the realizations, the rasa, the power of love to experience these things. And he was ordered by the Goswamis and the residents of Vrindavan to make this into a book. He felt totally unqualified. And Kaviraj Goswami throughout Chaitanya Charitamrita, he says, I take the dust of the feet of anybody who reads the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I'm here to serve you. He says, I'm, I'm lower than a worm in stool. I'm more fallen than Jagai and Madhai. If anyone even hears my name, they lose their piety. And if anyone speaks about me, they become sinful. Now, if you and me say this, it's likely that we want people to think we're advanced. But Srila Prabhupada and our acharyas, they tell us with total conviction 
that when Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is speaking these things, he is feeling it to the core of his heart. Narottam Das Thakur is praying, Lord Chaitanya, you have come to deliver the most fallen. And if you look throughout this entire planet, you will not find anyone more fallen than me. The prayers of Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami. So humble. Lord Chaitanya cried. He said, your humility is breaking my heart. Yes, the less we feel qualified, the more we have the opportunity to understand. We can't really test, taste the holy names until we have this realization I'm more, hum more humble than a blade of grass. Tolerant, forgiving like tree. Eager to offer all respect to others without expecting any in return. That state of consciousness is not just a theory. But it is impossible for a conditioned soul to achieve that. But it is possible by the causeless mercy of our gurus, the acharyas, the panchatattva and shishiradha madhava. This type of humility, this type of true devotion is given to us. It cannot be achieved. So in his deep faith for Srila Prabhupada, Srila Gaur Govinda Maharaj is giving us this incredible information of who Jagannath is and who Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is. And in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srila Prabhupada is describing it so elaborately. But it's so far beyond our realizations. Actually, if we're honest, when we read the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, that the spirit soul is not the body. How much is that beyond our realizations? To actually understand, I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm not this ego. I'm an eternal soul. I'm a part of God. That's the preliminary basic principle. What to speak of understanding the confidential pastimes of Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan and the culmination of that love as it is exchanged between Lord Jagannath and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu here in Puri. Yes, when Krishna was speaking to Srimati Radharani and Niduban, he described it in this way. Who are the Jagannath deities? Jagannath Balaram Subhadra, two logs of wood floating in the limitless ocean of Srimati Radharani and the Gopis' love. The 
these topics by hearing with a humble heart, give us a deeper appreciation of the treasure that Krishna will bestow upon us if we earnestly and sincerely serve his devotees. Try to believe, try to please our beloved founder, Acharya Srila Prabhupada. Help them to spread this movement with his Lord Chaitanya's reason for coming to this world through Sankirtan. Yes, when we chant our japa, when we chant our kirtan, when we're serving the Vaishnavas and serving the mission, when we're studying Srila Prabhupada's books and discussing the writings of the acharyas, what is the treasure that will be given to us? if we put aside our envy and our ego to really be a servant of a servant of a servant with eagerness to please Krishna. And I'll conclude tonight by speaking a wonderful pastime where Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada was visiting the Jagannath temple with his devotees in Puri. Have you been to Chattak Parvat yet, some of you? That is not different than Govardhan Hill, as the sea is not different than Yamuna. That is how Lord Chaitanya perceived it, and that is actually the reality of what Lord Chaitanya revealed to us. But coming down from Chattak Parvat, they went to Jagannath Temple, and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur described People are going to see Lord Jagannath, but that is not our purpose. Our purpose is that Jagannath will be pleased to see us. Jagannath is the seer. We are the scene. When we're chanting the holy names, and act to actually be able to really taste the infinite sweetness of the holy names, the holy names, which are Radha and Krishna, are actually pleased to taste our devotion. When we are truly sincere, then the real taste for bhakti comes. Do not try to see Krishna. Try to please Krishna and serve Krishna in a way that Krishna is pleased to see us. That is bhakti. So over 10,000 of us are gathered here in Jagannath Puri. And 
for Jagannath to be pleased to see us, to gaze upon us. We have the opportunity to attract the all attractive by the sincerity, the humility, the attentiveness in which we're trying to hear his glories in Krishna Kata. Chant the holy names in our japa and kirtan. Praying, praying and begging for the mercy of the Vaishnavas, the mercy of our gurus, the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu. A real beggar is not just artificially going door to door. A real beggar is one who really feels the necessity, the need. I have nothing. This is the way all of our acharyas have taught us to pray. Not only through our hearts and our words, but through our actions. So, I have been so much appreciating the wonderful prasad that's been cooked here in Puri during our yatra. Um, it's quite astounding to me. Gauranga Prabhu and Radha Bhava Prabhu and Vasudev Prabhu and all Damodar Prabhu and so many. There's hundreds of people in the kitchen every day. I went there this morning. So many ladies are gathered together. They made, I was told, 25,000 chapatis today. Now, some years ago, I was with our beloved Raghunath Prabhu in Amritsar, and we went to the Golden Temple. Um, it's the capital of the Sikh religion for the world. And they have this really, this was years ago, they had this big, big room with a huge machine to make chapatis. Have any of you seen that? It like, it, it covers a, like almost a stadium. <laughs> it's very large, this machine. And it makes the dough and it kneads the dough and it mixes the dough and it rolls the japatis and it cooks the japatis. And you just put flour and water in some pots and it goes through all different stages. And in the end, it comes out a perfect chapati. And every minute there's hundreds of them coming out. And each one is blown up perfectly like a full circle. It's amazing how it goes over a fire through this conveyor belt. They go, Voo. perfect chapati, 100% of them. So I was watching this and being a conditioned soul as I am, I got so hungry for chapatis. <laughs> I'm bringing the narration back to my level of consciousness now. <laughs> I wanted so much to have one of these chapatis. 
after watching hundreds and hundreds, thousands of them going, hmm? <laughs> So they invited me for lunch and they brought me to this room. And there's a couple ladies sitting on the floor, rolling chapatis and cooking them over a little burner and giving them to me. And I said, what about, you know, all those chapatis from the machine? And they said, no, no. They said, that's for the masses. But when there's a special guest, we cook them like this because there's the most love. So if you go back there, I don't know if you're supposed to go back there. Every morning for like six or seven hours, we could easily assemble a japati machine here. And maybe five or six people could just be putting, pouring the bags and pouring the water and then everything else is done. But there's hundreds of ladies all sitting around burners and, and rolling and cooking because, and there's smoke in their eyes and they're just sitting on the ground, old, young, from every background, from all different places of the world. And in the kitchen, there's those giant pots and so much smoke and so much cooking. They start at 3.34 in the morning for your lunch. And we could taste not just the expertise of the flavor, but also just those recipes. They spend, some people, they, in the early days, they were spending the whole year formulating the recipes for this quantities. And there's only one result. There's only one goal. That Krishna will be pleased because we have satisfied the devotees. This is the foundational state of consciousness. This mood of bhakti, sincere, humble, devotional service. That will attract, attract Srila Prabhupada to bestow his divine grace upon us. And when we get the mercy of the great souls, then yes, Krishna will give us, not because of any artificial efforts to achieve it, but when Krishna is truly pleased with us, he gives us realization of the super Supreme fortune that is literally showering on those who come as sincere, heartfelt beggars for the mercy of Jagannath Puri. Thank you very much.